Tom Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. In my recent videos, I said that the conjugate matching causes the reflected power that arrives back at the tuner to be re-reflected back at the feed line. The big question in people's minds is, how does it do that? And that is exactly the question I'm trying to answer for you in this video. I'm going to demonstrate these things using some experiments on the bench. Now, this is going to be a lot of fun. Now, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. So to begin with, we have to remind ourselves of some foundational basics, which will likely be review for many, but stay with me. So let's remember the playing field we're on. When we talk about conjugate matching, we're saying that the reactive or imaginary portion of the impedance of the matching impedance has the opposite sign from the impedance to be matched. So for example, if we're looking into the feed line at the antenna and we see an impedance of 10 minus J41, then the conjugate matching impedance would be 10 plus J41. This imaginary portion of the impedance is the reactance. And we have inductive reactance and we have capacitive reactance. Inductive reactance is equal to J times 2 times pi times the frequency in hertz times the inductance in henrys. Capacitive reactance is equal to minus J times the quantity 1 divided by the quantity 2 times pi times the frequency in hertz times the capacitance in farads. Notice that the inductive reactance is always positive and the capacitive reactance is always negative. Thus, in our example, when we're looking toward the antenna at the end of the feed line, we see a capacitive load because the reactive portion of the impedance is negative. This makes the matching impedance inductive because its reactive portion is positive. So, what do we get when we put a capacitor and an inductor in parallel where the magnitude of the reactances is equal? Well, we get a parallel resonance circuit. But let's think about what this means in a very basic level with ideal components just for a moment. So with ideal components, there are no parasitic values of capacitance, inductance, or resistance associated with them. They are just pure inductors and pure capacitors. So let's say that we ping this parallel resonance circuit with a pulse of voltage. This ping will charge the capacitor to a particular voltage. Now this constitutes energy stored in the electric field inside the capacitor. But the ping doesn't last forever and the electric field is now at its maximum. Now this capacitor has an inductor across it. This gives a current path out of the capacitor. So the capacitor discharges through the inductor transferring the stored energy of its electric field into the magnetic field of the inductor because of the current running through the inductor. Eventually, the energy contained in the electric field is exhausted. The current supplied to the inductor ceases and the magnetic field begins to collapse. The, this collapsing magnetic field passing over the inductor induces a voltage across the inductor. But, the inductor has the capacitor across it, and this voltage is applied to that capacitor, which charges the capacitor, storing the energy supplied by the inductor into the electric field of the capacitor. And so this process would continue forever back and forth between the capacitor and inductor if we don't draw any energy from it and if these were ideal components. So, 
energy is bouncing back and forth and back and forth between the magnetic field of the inductor and the electric field of the capacitor in a parallel resonance circuit. But of course, there's no such thing as ideal components, so the energy of our ping is slowly consumed by parasitic resistances associated with the components. Now, with this basic understanding under our belt, let's move to the bench for our first experiment. As you can see here, I have a capacitor and an inductor connected in parallel. The only parasitic entities associated with them are their own, and these are probably pretty small values. Now, I've connected the VNA to the circuit using a very small capacitor of 12 picofarads. It is the source of energy for this circuit. So, what do we expect to see? As the VNA sweeps across the frequencies, when the frequency of the VNA equals the resonant frequency of our circuit, the resonant circuit will suck more energy from the VNA. What we will see on the screen is that the return loss, or S11 value, will show a decided dip. So, what do we actually see? We see a decided dip at around 33 megahertz. At this point, the capacitor and inductor are exchanging energy at their resonant frequency. Now, we have to go to the next step to simulate the kind of impedances that we might see as we are looking into the output side of the antenna tuner. Well, when we are looking at the impedance of an antenna, we might see something like our example impedance of 10 minus J41. Now, this would constitute an SWR of about 8.4 to 1. I will call this ZA. The subsequent conjugate matching impedance would be 10 plus J41. I will call this ZM. Now, what would be the resulting impedance of these two impedances put in parallel with each other? We start out with the standard parallel equation for impedances which tells us that the total impedance is equal to ZA times ZM divided by ZA plus ZM. Putting our values into this and working out the result, we would get a resulting equivalent impedance of 89.05 plus J0. Notice that the reactive portion of the impedance is completely eliminated. And this is at the very core of the definition of resonance. To simulate this with our experiment, I'm going to add a 10 ohm resistor in series with the capacitor and a 10 ohm resistor in series with the inductor. Now, we have admittedly swamped out the Q of the resonance circuit with these added resistors. So, as a result, the response will be much more subtle than before. But Let's go to the bench. You can see that I've done this here. The rest of the setup is absolutely identical. What do we see now? As expected, the resonance dip is not nearly as pronounced as it was before, but it is most definitely still there. The capacitor and the inductor are exchanging energy and their respective energy fields back and forth and back and forth between the two entities, the energy goes. Okay, but the antenna is at the end of my feed line. Doesn't, well, that make a difference? Oh, well, let's see. So here we are with the same resonance circuit we had in the last experiment. Only the capacitor is at one end of the 50 ohm feed line and the inductor is at the other end. Now, I soldered them to connectors to make it easier to connect them to the feed line. And yes, I did carefully choose the frequency to make sure the feed line is approximately a half wavelength long, so the impedance as seen at the inductor end of the feed line is the same as it is on the capacitor end. This way, I can use the same resistor with the inductor and all. So, what do we see now? Well, funny, there's that same dip at 33 megahertz that we saw before without the feed line. So the capacitor and the inductor are still exchanging energy, only this time through the feed line, feed line losses and all. 
The inductor sends energy to the capacitor, which is then reflected back at the inductor, and so on and so forth. Now, the only real difference here between our situation with the antenna tuner and the antenna is that the antenna is actively sucking energy away to be radiated. Now, what does this all mean? So what does all this mean in terms of our antenna and our antenna tuner? Well, the antenna tuner sees an impedance at its end of the feed line and then presents this impedance's complex conjugate at its output. Now, if we've seen here, that means that the entire system is a resonant circuit. The antenna, the feed line, and the antenna tuner's output all form a resonant system at the frequency that the tuner is tuned to. All this is exactly what Walter Maxwell said in his book, Reflections, published by the ARRL. This means that the reflected power from the antenna is actually absorbed by the reactive components of the antenna tuner, stored as either a magnetic field or an electric field inside the antenna tuner, and then released back to the feed line to travel to the antenna. But we have to remember that the transmitter is also pumping energy into that same system, and this energy becomes part of this same process. Thus, the release of energy of both the reflected power, which has been stored in the reactive components of the tuner, plus the transmitter's power, which has been added to that, is always in phase with the transmitter's power and sent as a whole to the antenna at the other end of the feed line. So the antenna tuner turns the entire antenna system into a resonant circuit, which, apart from the losses in the feed line and the energy delivered to the antenna, conserve its energy in the reactive components of the system. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.